Hello there. I'm going to read to you from um, Jeremy Poldark. Okay. And you have all these illustrations on the cover. Like that. And these illustrations were drawn by Charles Mosley. And this is the seventh impression of this particular um, print. And it was £7.95 and sold only in the UK. And it was withdrawn from the City of York Libraries. And I've crossed out how much it was withdrawn for because I bought it for about a pound or something um, from uh, Fittick Library. I'm really glad I did now. I love these stories. I've read them so many times. Well, I'd say so many, probably three times. And um, they accompanied my youth. I always had one of these books with me. So there we are. Uh, this is an extract from chapter 9. And of course, Ross is being tried in Truro. I think it's Truro he's being tried in. Is in court and everybody's had to go. And this is an extract between Dr. Ennis and his guest. Dwight did not stay long. He did not know Dr. Halliwell, and one could never be sure that his visit might not be unwelcome. When he got out into the street again, he took some grateful breaths of the night air. It had been raining heavily while he was inside, and more was blowing up from the west. But it had not at all dampened the spirits of the revellers, and there were dozens still roistering in the streets. He saw two of the more respectable merchants being pushed home in wheelbarrows. The innkeeper met him with the news of the unexpected visitor. Dwight had forgotten all about his morning invitation to Francis, and their encounter this afternoon made him wish he'd never issued it. He went up the stairs expecting to find his guest sprawling asleep on the bed, and his irritation was increased when he found the door locked. He thumped on it impatiently, hoping his guest was not too drunk to hear. There was no reply. It was too bad, for there might be no means of waking the man before morning. The landlord probably would have another key, even supposing this one was not blocking the keyhole on the other side. Dwight thumped again with all his strength. The dark, narrow passage was cobwebbed in every corner, and there were cracks along the wall, walls where they bulged as, as if some superior weight was leaning on them from the other side. The claustrophobe would have shrunk and hurried through before they collapsed together and trapped him. From one of the wider cracks near the door, a black beetle showed up for a moment, as if disturbed and resenting the noise. Suddenly Dwight heard a movement inside the room and the key turned. With relief, he lifted the latch and went in, and was surprised to see the bed empty and unused, and Francis walking slowly back to the table on which the two candles burned. His irritation going, Dwight laughed a little awkwardly. You'll excuse the noise. I thought you might be asleep. Francis did not reply, but sat down at the table and stared at two sheets of paper in front of him. He didn't look as drunk as when they last met. With mounting surprise, Dwight noticed the clean shirt, the neat neckcloth, and the completely bloodless face. After a minute, he said, The landlord told me you'd come. I thought you might have difficulty. The town is fairly seething. Yes, said Francis, aware of some deeper tension within the room that he had yet penetrated to. Dwight slowly unbuttoned his coat and threw it off, stood for a moment in his shirt sleeves, uncomfortable, hesitating. The other man's silence forced him to go on. I was sorry for leaving so sharply this afternoon, but as I explained, I had to rejoin a friend. You've supped, I suppose. What? Oh, yes. If you're writing a letter, go on with it. No. Silence fell. Dwight stared at the other more closely. What's wrong? Are you a fatalist, Dennis? 
Francis brought his brows together in a sudden grimace of nervous resentment. It broke out all over his frozen face like a storm. Do you believe we are masters of ourselves or merely dance like puppets on strings, having the illusion of independence? I don't know. I'm afraid I'm a little tired for a philosophical discussion. Have you some personal problem before you that puts the question more conveniently? Only this. Francis swept the papers impatiently aside and picked up the pistol they had covered. Five minutes ago, I tried to shoot myself, but the thing misfired. Since then, I have been debating whether I should try again. A glance showed Dwight that the other man was not joking. He stared at Francis, trying to find something to say. You're a little shocked. Francis said and pointed the pistol at his face and squinted down the barrel, his finger on the trigger. Of course, it wouldn't have been in the best of taste to have made use of the hospitality of your chamber for such a purpose. But none of my own was to be had, and as to do it in some dark corner of a street is faintly vulgar. I'm sorry, anyway, the thing's not done yet. So you have a talkative companion for a few moments instead of a silent one. Dwight stared at him, resisting the impulse to say or do the obvious things. A wrong move might be fatal. After a long minute, he forced himself to relax, to move across to the ewer and basin by the window, so that his back was towards the other. He began to wash his hands and found they were not quite steady. He felt that Francis was closely watching him. I don't understand you, he said at length. I don't understand why you could possibly wish to destroy yourself, and if you did, why you should ride twenty-five miles to a strange town to do it. There was a rustle of papers as if Francis was put, were putting them together. The deceased behaved irrationally before he died, is that it? But who behaves rationally even when wanting to stay alive? If we were thinking brains suspended in fluid, but we're not. We have viscera, my dear Ernest. As you should know, the nerves and blood and things called emotions. One can develop a quite unreasoning prejudice against spilling one's blood on one's own doorstep. Impulses are hard to put under a slide rule. If this was an impulse, then I hope it's passed. No, it is not. But now you are here, give me your opinion. What happens to a resolve when you put the barrel to your head and pull the trigger and the hammer clicks and nothing takes place? Do you accept the jibe, not having had the foresight to buy fresh powder or the intelligence to realise that powder kept for long in this damned Cornish atmosphere gets damp? Or is it the last humiliation to shirk another try? Dwight began to dry his hands. It's the only sensible course. But you didn't quite answer my question. Why suicide? If I may say so, you're young, propertied, respected, have a wife and a son, safely got through serious illness, are under no cloud. Stop, said Francis, or I shall weep for joy. Dwight half turned, and out of the corner of his eyes saw that the pistol now lay on the table again, a hand resting lightly on it. Well, if you were your cousin, I might see a greater reason for all this. He has lost his only child, is likely to have some sentence tomorrow, failed last year in an enterprise he put all his heart to. Francis got up, pushing the table aside with a squeak, stalked across the room. God damn you, be quiet! Dwight set down the towel. No doubt Ross still has his self-respect which you, perhaps, have lost. Francis turned. At close quarters his face was streaky with dried sweat. What makes you feel that? The pistol was a long way away. Dwight felt a little more confident of being able to deal with the situation. Francis looked ill as well as angry. I think there must be a loss of self-respect before suicide can even be thought of. You do, eh? Yes, I do. Francis made the facial movements of a laughter which was more bitter for its silence. There are times when it may be the only means of restoring one's self-respect. Can you conceive that, or is it outside your scope? 
It's not outside my scope to imagine such a situation, but I'm not able to imagine why you should feel yourself in it. Let's see. What were those gracious words you used? Young, propertied, respected? By young, by what standards? And propertied, did you say? The question is, who owns the property in these bankrupt days? Usually some upstart sneering money lender with a smooth voice and the ethical code of a cuttlefish. And respect, Francis said the word savagely, respected by whom? We are back at the same old gate, respect of oneself, which is the impasse. Drink loosens the disillusion but sharpens the paradox. A pistol ball has no morning after. Dwight went across and lit another couple of candles on the mantelpiece. The shadows at the end of the room lifted, showing the faded flock paper, the dusty antlers of the stag. The light was like a creeping sanity moving over the dark places of the mind. A pistol ball is very dramatic he said slowly. Sudden solutions usually are. You ought to know that, your profession. But you can't rule them out because they offend your sense of propriety. Oh, I don't. All the same, I prefer things on a more homely level. Let's have a drink and talk it over. What's the hurry? We've all night before us. Dear God, Francis let out a slow breath and turned away. My tongue's like burnt paper. In the street outside, someone was laughing inanely. Dwight went to the cupboard. I've brandy here. We can sample that. He heard Francis folding the papers and stuffing them into his pocket. When he turned, Francis had picked up the pistol again, but was taking out the bullet. Half done, he hesitated, and the glitter came back into his eyes. Drink this said Dwight quickly. Cheap gin will poison you and bring up all sorts of unhealthy thoughts. The thoughts were there without the gin. Well, you can tell me about them. If it pleases you, I don't mind. Thank you, but I'll keep my sorrows to myself. He accepted the glass and looked at it. Well, here's to the devil. I don't know whose side he has been on tonight. White drank without comment. The emotional storm was blowing itself out. Chance had prevented Francis from making his gesture. In exhaustion, he would now wish to talk of anything but tonight's motives. But that was just why it was important that he should do so. Only by getting him to talk it out of himself could one make reasonably sure that the crisis should not happen again.